Hi, it's Kayla from C-SPAN. Imagine 45 years ago when there was just a handful of television networks. C-SPAN first went on the air bringing an unfiltered view of government directly to America's living rooms. No spin, no commentary, just pure democracy in action. And it's Greta from C-SPAN. It was a bold experiment. We finally had a front row seat to Congress, the White House, and the campaign trail, all without government funding. As we celebrate 45 years and a legacy of unfiltered access, we ask for your support of a donation in honor of our four decades of service. Your gift, no matter how big or small, will help maintain this vital resource for access to the democratic process. You can help ensure another 45 years of witnessing history unfold and empowering citizens to be informed and engaged in the political process. Visit cspan.org slash donate today and join our 45th anniversary campaign. Thank you for supporting C-SPAN, your unfiltered view of government. Visit cspan.org slash donate today to make your gift of support. Thank you. South Carolina's economy is growing, bringing new businesses and opportunities. The need for electricity is growing, too. At Duke Energy, we're meeting the challenge providing even more electricity that's reliable, that stays affordable. To do this, we're investing in our communities with a diverse, balanced mix of energy sources and making targeted upgrades to the grid so that South Carolina can thrive in a smarter energy future. Paid for by Duke Energy shareholders. Ow! Those uncomfortable things we do for beauty. Oof. Ouch. And when it comes to whiter teeth, same story. Until now. Enjoy wince-free whitening with new Sensodyne Clinical White. You'll get clinically proven whitening technology in an enamel-safe formula for two shades whiter teeth and 24-7 sensitivity protection. (sighs) Sensodyne Clinical White, a whiter smile without the wince. in this audience may even be someone who will one day follow in my footsteps and preside over the White House as the President's spouse, and I wish him well. Katie Rogers, White House correspondent for the New York Times, you write in your book, American Woman, about Barbara Bush's 1990 Wellesley commencement address. You write... Americans who observed the speech that day saw a first lady who used grit and grace to nod to a new generation and acknowledge that times were changing. What's the background of that speech and why did you include it in a book about 21st century first ladies? Sure. Actually, that that um, that opening scene came through my reporting. Actually, I spent almost two and a half years reporting this book. And it just actually came through a conversation I had with a historian who knew the office better than I did um, and talked to me about this speech that former First Lady Barbara Bush gave um, and said, wow, this was really a moment. The tides were changing. And I, she, this woman said, um, you know, that is really the moment that marked a sea change, both in the in the office itself and against the backdrop of what was happening culturally um, in America. So I went back and watched the speech and did more research about it. It was a front page story, this controversy about Barbara Bush, um, a woman who did not work outside of the home, giving a speech to these women at Wellesley who were um, part of uh, feminism second wave who were uh, beginning to question what they could want outside of the home um, versus being inside the home only. Um, the first person who was invited to give a speech that year, which is quite telling, I think it was Alice Walker, um, who uh, is is famous as, as 
many readers and 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 um observers of sort of the developments in feminism know she coined the term womanist rather than feminist to be more inclusive and more forward thinking about what it meant uh, to be a feminist. Uh, Walker turned the invitation down and the second invitation went to Barbara Bush. It was a front page story in the New York Times about the petition that went around not wanting her to speak. Um, the president got involved, which is just if you think about the president getting involved in a first lady's commencement speech, that was a huge degree of controversy about whether or not the first lady was invited to come. And he said, I think these women have a lot to learn from our first lady. And sure enough, um, Barbara Bush, who was very savvy and, and led through instinct, came into that uh, setting where she knew the odds were kind of against her and flipped that entire idea on its head as you as you played in that in that first clip. Um, this acknowledgement that times were changing, that you could have both. She said also, you know, you you might regret, you know, you might not regret, um, you know, missing that meeting, but you would regress, regret me- missing that time with your family and your spouse was essentially, I'm paraphrasing, but there was this really elegant and graceful acknowledgement from her that um, women were at a, at a period in, in our culture and in our history where they wanted both. And that was, um, you know, that that phrase having it all was kind of coined during this period. And we've been asking ourselves what that means ever since. And when you talk about a sea change, Barbara Bush left college for to marry George H.W. Bush. But four, four of the five last first ladies have all had advanced degrees. That's right. And but, you know, only one first lady, Jill Biden, has worked outside of this role, which is essentially the most scrutinized volunteer role in American politics. Um, the, I mean, the fact that there are women who have had this role with advanced degrees and not sort of pursued that um, says something about sort of these um, unofficial but very rigid expectations around the role. Well, Barbara Bush was not the first first lady to speak at a Wellesley commencement. It was 21 years earlier. Let's listen. We're not in the positions yet of leadership and power, but we do have that indispensable element of criticizing and constructive protest. What are we listening to, Katie Rogers? We are listening to a commencement speaker, uh, Hillary Rodham, addressing her class um, at a moment where um, politics and what is happening outside of the campus is really just sort of raging civil rights is a huge uh, discussion at this moment in time. And um, Hillary Rodham requested to sort of deliver this speech to her to fellow graduates, and it was considered a really radical thing to do. There was a sitting senator in the audience, and she sort of challenged this idea of the status quo. Well, you write that her speech received a standing ovation, but dropped the jaws of the more conservative, older adults in her midst. Yeah, I think Wellesley had to send a letter of apology to some of the adults in that audience, in fact. What was so controversial about it? Just the fact that there was a young woman who was willing to get up and speak out against societal norms and what was expected of young people at that time. Was that a sign of Hillary Rodham Clinton's first lady tenure of being groundbreaking? I mean, looking at her entire history, I, I, I do think so. And I think it's also a sign of, of how much more she would have wanted to do with that role and how much more she did do beyond being first lady afterwards. I mean, she is um, an interesting figure in our history in general for how willing she has been to sort of take take some hits for speaking out and um, pushing the boundaries of, of first being a student and then being a first lady and then being a presidential candidate. Um, I think her time at Wellesley and her time at First Lady are two of the most interesting phases of her life. And when she served as First Lady, you really sort of see her getting the scar tissue that comes with 
um, being more involved politically and being seen as sort of an intellectual and political equal um, as her husband did view her. The use of her maiden name when she was practicing law in Arkansas, did that hurt her politically? I mean, it's hard to say because she wasn't, you know, she wasn't pursuing politics at that time. I mean, she was married to somebody who was very interested in it. Uh, But so um, it was just more of an anomaly and a weirdness when she would be at a mixer or not a mixer, but like a a networking event. And she would have that sort of Hillary Rodham Clinton on her badge and people didn't know how to take that. It was literally a foreign concept for a woman to want to stick to her given name at birth. Um, And it was only until a Clinton advisor, Vernon Jordan, advised her and said, this is likely hurting your husband, that she relented. Um, It was even a big deal for her to keep Rodham on stationary. Um, So she eventually, I mean, to your point, yes, it was more in the service of helping her husband succeed if she gave that up, Um, which seems, I think, to a lot of women now, like such a, um, you know, a strange thing to be asked to do. But I mean, it wasn't that long ago. In your book, American Women, Woman, you write about this next video we want to show. This is Hillary Rodham Clinton in 1992 on the campaign trail. You know, I'm not sitting here as some little woman standing by my man like Tammy Wynette. I'm sitting here because I love him and I respect him and I honor what he's been through and what we've been through together. And, you know, if that's not enough for people, then heck, don't vote for him. Katie Rogers, what was the reaction to the stand by your man comment? I mean, I think it was explosive. And one of the most interesting things stylistically about that response is the twang that is still in her voice. Um, She begins to lose it the more she begins to answer questions like this and be asked about what sort of spouse she would be and what um, she was constantly asked to characterize her marriage. And she adopts the more she returns to this more steely kind of Midwestern way of speaking, the more she is asked about this. And that's just an aside that I find fascinating. You know, that is that to me is politics um, in play. But um, so, yeah, the response was was explosive. Um, And one of the more interesting things about her is how observers never seem to land on a conclusion of whether or not she should stand by her man or or show some daylight. Well, it was almost exactly one year later when her husband, Bill Clinton, made this announcement. I am grateful that Hillary has agreed to chair this task force, and not only because it means she'll be sharing some of the heat I expect to generate. As many of you know, while I was governor of my state, Hillary chaired the Arkansas Education Standards Committee, which created public school accreditation standards that have since become a model for national reform. She served as my designee on the Southern Regional Task Force on Infant Mortality, was also chair of our state's Rural Health Committee in 1979 and 1980. I think that in the coming months, the American people will learn, as the people of our state did, that we have a first lady of many talents, but who most of all can bring people together around complex and difficult issues to hammer out consensus and get things done. Katie Rogers, had any first lady in the past had such a public-facing policy role? No, and I think it's important to understand that in the context of that Clinton campaign, um, the candidate, you know, Bill Clinton sort of had said, essentially, you get two for one with us, um, which also, you know, didn't set her up for success in the eyes of people who didn't want that. I think I think the Clintons came into office assuming that Americans were ready for that. Um, So I think. You know, I think the reaction to um, appointing her the lead of this commission on reforming health care was was a sign that the Clintons kind of misread where a lot of the country was on, um, you know, uh, president and first lady involving themselves, um, uh, involving her actually so deeply in a policy issue. 
You write, no first lady had ever tried to push the boundaries of her role so far and so fast. The speed yeah. and aggression of the effort was too much for Americans. Other first ladies had advocated for policy, but none had testified before the Senate or traveled the country or been burned in effigy. What was going on? I mean, there was so much anger over the Clinton White House moving really fast on this issue that um, uh, one of her advisors told me that it was just terrifying to be out in, uh, you know, essentially on this on the stump for this for this policy matter when people would be banging on the motorcade cars or burning her in effigy um, across the country. There was just so much anger that, you know, even, you know, to this day, she, um, Hillary Clinton and her advisors feel was pretty much completely gendered. And, you know, I, I think that that's, there's a more complicated um, set of factors that went into sort of the anger over that. But I think it's, it's hard to deny with some of the criticism that it, you know, that it was. When you interviewed Hillary Rodham Clinton for your book, did you talk about the health care policy issue? We did. And I, I remember asking her, you know, knowing what you know now, would you have done this differently? Would you have stepped back? And I remember saying, I imagine that you you might you might not have. And she actually said, no, I would have. Uh, you know, it's important to me to seek a solution. And I'm a policy person. And if it meant me stepping back, you know, I would have done that. And of course, hindsight is twenty twenty, and who knows what, you know, you don't get the opportunity to do things like that over again, you know, but her point was very much, you know, seemed to be coming from somebody who had learned, um, you know, through the hard way, really, that, um, you know, Americans didn't want that from a first lady. You write that Laura Bush benefited from Hillary Rodham Clinton. How so? Well, I mean, something as small, one one uh, Clinton advisor said, you know, Hillary couldn't ever wear plant suits. It was a huge problem in the media or it was dissected, you know, <clears throat> within an inch of its life if she wore anything but, you know, skirts. And even something as small as Laura Bush wearing pantsuits all the time, the Clinton, Clinton advisors um, see that as evidence of just something that was smoothed out for the next first lady. Now, I know that that is... Uh, you know, it seems superficial on its face. Um, I, I would argue that it's not. But also, you know, Laura Bush had the benefit of coming after somebody who had been really just sort of raked over um, by the media, by uh, her political opponents um, during the impeachment, obviously. So when it's and there's also the factor that Laura Bush became a wartime first lady unexpectedly. So it's not all related to Hillary Clinton, but Laura Bush was able to take over the president's radio address weekly during the war. And um, Clinton advisors see that as something, you know, just in no way Hillary Clinton would have been able to do to speak for her husband in any sort of formal capacity like that, especially after um, the health care uh, debacle. And here is Laura Bush from November 17th, 2001. Only the terrorist and the Taliban forbid education to women. Only the terrorist and the Taliban threaten to pull out women's fingernails for wearing nail polish. The plight of women and children in Afghanistan is a matter of deliberate human cruelty carried out by those who seek to intimidate and control. Civilized people throughout the world are speaking out in horror, not only because our hearts break for the women and children in Afghanistan, but also because in Afghanistan, we see the world the terrorist would like to impose on the rest of us. Katie Rogers, that was a big deal at the time? I mean, really, it, it wasn't a big deal, <clears throat> I mean, in the moment. But if you look at it through the course of or in the context of what Laura Bush was doing versus what Hillary Clinton had been attempting to do, um, it is a big deal. It is a it's a huge deal that she could speak on behalf of the administration on foreign policy of all of all things. Um, so that's it. I mean, I think in the moment it was it was truly I mean, if you think back to that time, it was a it was a tr collectively traumatic period for the American people. The Bushes didn't see it coming. She had to step up into this role that she had no expectation of of 
of taking, you know, which is the wartime. Um, uh, the president is a consular in chief, but the, the first lady does share some of that responsibility. Um, so, you know, I, I think it was seen as sort of a, a what was needed, all hands on deck. But in the context of what came immediately before her, that is a big deal. Now, some of the adjectives you use in your book to describe Laura Bush, restless, independent, quiet force, covert, not overt communicator. Mm -hmm. What are you getting at? I'm getting at Laura Bush had a style and this was talking, you know, talking to experts who analyzed uh, hers and each, you know, modern first lady's speeches was that Laura Bush had a way of communicating that was very, um, it came across as um, invested and and related to her administration, but not intrinsically linked, not overtly political. It was more um, through the lens of a mother and a wife and a supporter of her husband who cared about these issues, not as <clears throat> a fellow policy um, wonk, a senior advisor, um, somebody with her own extensive um, track record, understanding um, the political implications around everything that happened. Um, Laura Bush's um, approach was very much um, through the lens of a supporting role, and um, which doesn't make it any less effective, but it is a different approach. Uh, a more traditional approach, yes. I think you could say more traditional approach for sure. Yes. You know, that's, you know, um, even, you know, somebody like Eleanor Roosevelt was very much, she would have her own press conferences. She would have her own um, independent sort of um, travel schedule uh, um, and, and writing schedule of, uh, from her husband. But very, she very much, even, even she would say that is my husband's domain uh, when asked about um, politics or, or the weeds of foreign policy. Um, and and Laura Bush kind of adopted that model, um, even more, I guess, traditional than that. Wyndham Hotels and Resorts makes travel possible for all. Whether it's the long haulers looking for a great cup of coffee, a roomier rest for the on a whim road trippers, or a place to make summer memories with the whole family. No matter who you are, where you're going, or why, with 24 trusted brands to choose from like La Quinta, Days Inn, and Super 8, your Wyndham is waiting. Get the lowest price at WyndhamHotels.com. Restrictions apply. Visit website for more details. South Carolina's economy is growing, bringing new businesses and opportunities. The need for electricity is growing, too. At Duke Energy, we're meeting the challenge providing even more electricity that's reliable, that stays affordable. To do this, we're investing in our communities with a diverse, balanced mix of energy sources and making targeted upgrades to the grid so that South Carolina can thrive in a smarter energy future. Paid for by Duke Energy shareholders. Here's Laura Bush in 2005 at the White House Correspondents Association dinner. And so the city slicker asked the old guy how to get to the nearest town. Not that old joke. Not again. <laughs> I've been attending these dinners for years and just quietly sitting there. Well, I've got a few things I want to say for a change. <laughs> George always says he's delighted to come to these press dinners. Baloney. He's usually in bed by now. I'm not kidding. I said to, to him the other day, George, if you really want to end tyranny in the world, you're going to have to stay up later. That taking over the speech of her husband was a big hit in Washington. I mean, I think any time... I mean, a big hit because... Laura Bush is actually smart and, and very funny and very quick. And on top of everything else, her public persona was very much, as I just said, sort of that's my husband's domain and, and this is mine. Um, to have her sort of show this like very um, dry, pragmatic, Texan sort of sense of humor. I also write in the book that 
you know, people, you know, Bush advisors would tell me, you know, she was there to remind George Bush who he was and where he came from. And you you see and hear that in that speech. In 2013, C-SPAN did a series called First Ladies, and we sat down with Laura Bush for an extended interview. Here's what she had to say about how she viewed her role as First Lady. We have had for a number of years in the United States, probably since our very beginning, and you all know this from your First Lady series, very active and involved First Ladies who uh, both support their husbands and their policies there husbands are working on, but also in many, many cases have their own initiatives, Um, a lot of times to help women, uh, a lot of times to help children. And uh, what we want the first ladies from around the world to know is that they can also do that, Uh, that there is a role for first ladies to have, uh, to talk about especially women's issues and especially issues that have to do with children. Katie Rogers, as a White House correspondent, is it important or do people think about what the First Lady's agenda is? Oh, uh, yes, of course they do. I mean, from the beginning of, you know, I've, I've only covered the Trump and Biden White Houses, but, you know, through my reporting and writing in this book, there are questions at the outset of every term, like what is the first lady's portfolio? What is her agenda? What is she going to be doing? Is she going to have one issue or multiple? Isn't it a mistake to have multiple and not one, which is like what we've seen with um, Jill Biden right now. You know, the, the fact that she doesn't have sort of this tent pole issue has been a constant question about, is that effective? Is that the right thing to do? People are, uh, I think, enormously interested in in the potential of uh, the first lady to sort of prompt change to Laura Bush's point about um, being an advocate for women and children. But I think, you know, there is also sort of this um, underlying curiosity um, from the American people. Um, And it's it's a totally reasonable curiosity. How much influence does she have with her husband? How much can she affect change through her husband? And what is what does that agenda look like privately between the two of them? Um, and that's sort of an interesting subtext of all of that interest. And um, you really see that, you know, from the Clinton White House on forward, which is what this book is about. And Laura Bush invited historians to the White House late in their administration to discuss legacy, didn't she? That's right. I think that, um, you know, I talked to several people who were invited for that. And um, they had relayed to me that she, you know, for as much as she did during um, the Bush presidency, she was curious about how history would perceive her and what she could do or how she should think about framing herself, um, you know, framing her legacy, honestly, um, you know, after she was done. And um, that was sort of the question she had for historians at the end. And how do you think she's perceived today? That's a really good question. Um, You know, I think, as you know, I think the Bushes exited Washington in a time of a lot of criticism around the choices that President Bush made um, in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. Um, I think... Now, you know, 20, 23, almost 23 years on, um, Laura Bush is seen as almost a sort of a a more medi- mediating force, maybe, on the presidency. She sort of brought his foreign policy and even his domestic policy decisions on No Child Left Behind. She used sort of the Laura Bush first lady lens to sort of put a softer focus on some of those those choices. And, you know, that is for Americans to decide whether or not that was the right thing to do. But I think, you know, looking back at her, she sort of had this ability to reframe um, some really hard sort of uh, questions Americans were asking and uh, explain that to the public. Katie Rogers, you report that Jill Biden invited historians already to the White House early in their administration. Did that help to clarify her role? 
Another great question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, based on, you know, I interviewed upwards of 125 people for this book and many of them were on about her. And I think, you know, based on my reporting and, and this isn't my opinion, it's just, she had her priorities, which, you know, it's central to that was, you know, supporting her husband, but just right next to that priority was maintaining her own identity as a teacher. Um, you know, she is somebody who married into the Biden family when Joe Biden was already a senator, she was a teacher. She has used, I think, and viewed teaching as a way to sort of stabilize her own identity in this very, you know, defined family. Like the goal, the North Star has been Joe Biden and his political ambition. And her interest in sort of keeping something for herself is a huge driver. Um, so I think when she met with those historians. It was almost a gut check, I think, to sort of um, assess whether or not having a few different um, initiatives that were smaller, which is supporting military families, cancer research and free community college, um, you know, whether that was enough. And it was a debate as as you, you know, as you might have read in the book of whether or not that was. Um, so I don't know that it def- by, you know, helped her define her legacy anymore. I think whatever happened um, after that meeting, it's pretty clear that she has kept teaching. And also another thing is, is she's a very popular um, and effective campaigner for her husband. That is what she is really good at. So she, um, you know, more than anything, more than policy, it's been teaching and um, raising money and traveling the country in uh, service of her husband. From your book, Jill winced at the idea that the historians thought she was only doing what was personally important to her, despite Mm -hmm. the element of truth to that feedback. The Mm -hmm. Bidens have been safely ensconced among their loyalists for decades, but have often said that they wanted to hear from outside of their established bubbles. The suggestion that she was undertaking these causes because she was personally attracted to them was not something that she was used to hearing. That is true. There is a historian who asks her asks her within the uh, within that um, in that meeting, to, or not asks her, but really just gives her the feedback. You know, Americans see you as you know personally involved with cancer research. Um, you know, and that's of course related to um, she had friends who died of breast cancer early in her life, but also Bo Biden, uh, the Biden son, died in 2015 of. Uh, brain cancer. So the feedback from the historians was like, it's great that you are interested in this and also that you are interested in community college as an educator, but people see you as personally tied to these things. Um, And so that was kind of, um, you know, bruising for her to hear afterwards, you know, in terms of when she was discussing the feedback um, with AIDS. Um, So, yeah, I mean, that was, I think, something that, you know, she was proud of, you know, she was proud of her efforts um, is proud of her efforts in, in the arenas of cancer research and education. And to hear that that was perhaps not enough to break through to more Americans um, was a hard thing to hear. She's the first with an outside job, still teaches English on Tuesdays at Nova Community College in Northern Virginia. And you write that that is a sacrosanct commitment. She said, make it happen. That's right. And I think what isn't publicly known that my book details is the degree to which she had to really sort of fight to be able to teach without her husband or his advisor sort of wondering out loud um, how she would be paid, how it wouldn't run afoul of ethics laws. Um, you know, her uh, President Biden was concerned, uh, now President Biden was concerned that it would be all too much for her. And she really, with the help of um, her aides, had to sort of push to be able to do this and convince everyone that it was okay to do. Um, so yeah, she really had to sort of work behind the scenes to make that happen. And no, it wasn't a given. go go ahead. I'm sorry. It, it just wasn't a given that she would teach, even though she had publicly said, I plan to. And no reporters allowed. You have not attended one of the classes, correct? Oh no. I mean, that is a serious, you know, church and state division and, um, you know, 
uh, I think any reporter who asks the college um, gets routed immediately to the East Wing, um, which, you know, that's that's her prerogative. Um, but as a reporter, I mean, I, I think it's such a huge part of her identity and her life story that, um, you know, it's interesting to me that they don't allow um, people to see that, um, especially because it's such a huge um part of her public identity. But you did check out her Rate My Professor reviews. What did you <laughs> yeah, find? I did. Um, they think she's a tough grader. She, um, and you know, she's always grading um, on on trips I've, I've taken with her. Um, I've seen her sort of pouring over the papers and she's very invested in um, uh, just getting feedback to her students. Katie Rogers, from your extended interviews with Jill Biden, what what are your impressions? My impressions? I mean, that's a that's a short question with a long answer. I think, um, you know, I think she's been in public life for a really long time, as has her husband, um, and I think that she is very practiced at um, allowing glimpses of her personal life um, that have already been sort of uh, vetted and workshopped and um, approved over a lot of years. There's not, um, you know, she argues that there's not much difference between who she is in public and who she is in private. And, you know, that's that's an interesting thing to say. Um, so I guess that's a way of saying she has learned to guard herself over many years in the public eye. Um, she's she's uh, conversational. She's curious. She often answers a question with a question, which I think is, you know, an interesting, um, you know, tactic in an interview. Um, I, I just think that she's hard to sort of get to know. But then again, you know, she's given so much of herself to um, to the public already that I think that is, I can understand how that it would be very important to protect. We're going to show some video of her on the campaign trail in 2020 in Los Angeles. And Katie Rogers, you describe her as the family enforcer and protector, a Philly girl, America's mother. She took those protesters right down who came up on the stage. That is, I I feel like I've watched that video probably 30 times. I mean, it's just really um, says a lot about her instincts, I think, in that moment um, to sort of get between her husband and anyone trying to hurt him um she is you know the biden family is very protective over the president in general and has been for a long time um but she sort of makes up this core of of wanting to make sure he's okay and she is tough i mean she's you know she is there is part of that philly girl persona that's that's absolutely true you know, that's who she is. At Mayo Clinic in Florida, we're conquering the unconquerable. Using artificial intelligence and data, our experts can create a personalized gene roadmap just for you, customizing your cancer treatment, giving your body exactly what it needs to fight the disease. We're making more possible at Mayo Clinic because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic you know where to go. Was she willing to talk about her role as mother to Bo and Hunter and subsequently Ashley and the age issue that's uh, being discussed in political circles now? Yeah, I mean, she talked, she talked about Hunter in the sense that 
she checks in on him really regularly. She works, she's, she's his mom, you know, um, you know, obviously Bo and Hunter's mother, Nelia died in 1972 along with their infant, um, sister, but, you know, they view, they, they call, you know, Nelia mommy and they refer to Jill as mom, uh, the first lady as mom, excuse me. Um, but you know, she, she wants to check in with Hunter regularly to let him know that, she loves him. She's thinking about him. Um, Ashley as well. Uh, you know, and I think Bo, I just think, you know, it's very apparent almost, you know, regularly. And also in light of this special counsel report that came out last week, how gutting the loss of Bo was and how um, how much they still feel that loss. Here's Jill Biden at the 2020 Democratic Convention. There are those who want to tell us that our country is hopelessly divided, that our differences are irreconcilable. But that's not what I've seen over these last few months. We're coming together and holding on to each other. We're finding mercy and grace in the moments we might have once taken for granted. We're seeing that our differences are precious and our similarities infinite. We have shown that the heart of this nation still beats with kindness and courage. Katie Rogers. I mean, I I have a reaction to it in the sense that that was a huge promise of the Bidens in 2020, that they were going to be the uniters and um, sort of work to knit the country back together after um, four years of Donald Trump and after a hugely traumatic national experience that was the coronavirus pandemic. Um, my reaction to that um, is that the tone is very different this year. Um, there's not much talk of unity. I think there's, you know, an acknowledgement that that is much easier said than done. Do you get the chance to see Jill Biden around the White House when you're uh, working on your day job? No, I mean, I, I'm when I'm there, I'm in, you know, the West Wing or the briefing room or having, um, you know, interactions with people who work for the president mostly. Um, I don't see her unless I'm at an event that the East Wing is hosting um, or traveling with her. She's not somebody who's, um, you know, walking around the West Wing um you know, having informal meetings with advisors or her husband. She is very, um, you know, she trusts that they are protecting him and doing the right thing for him and and working effectively for him, um, you know, without her having to sort of micromanage that. How big is the New York Times staff at the White House? How many reporters do you have there? Um, I think we have Six now. Uh, it it changes depending on whether somebody's traveling abroad and filling in for reporters abroad or working on on projects. But I think we have six right now. What was your path to the New York Times? My path to the New York Times. So I'm from um, Elkhart, Indiana, um, and started out at my hometown paper called the Elkhart Truth in um, 2007. Um, and that was when the great recession happened. And this, I'm only going back this far cause it's a pretty weird path compared to a lot of my colleagues. Um, and I decided to go to graduate school at Northwestern because the economy was terrible. There weren't a lot of reporting jobs. And I thought maybe if I got a graduate degree in journalism that I could, you know, go somewhere bigger, um, and work in digital media. I, I was always really interested in, in, um, blogging. I'd blog since I was a kid and, and so reporting through social media, finding people on Facebook and Twitter. And, and back then that was like very new and very sort of um, not revolutionary, but it was just this whole other world of, of reporting that, that was unlocked. And that came naturally to me. So um, I made my way to Washington. Um, I worked on the social media desk at the Washington Post and transitioned to sort of local reporting um, and I did a lot of the same work at the Guardian, um, you know, sort of breaking news through social media, 
um, and reporting that way. And then I got a job at the Times um, working on an app and I actually got hired on the overnight shift 10 years ago to sort of run a news app. And um, weirdly enough, that was during, um, you know, um, the sort of tumult in Ferguson. So I would report overnight and feed breaking news stuff to the the, the national desk or the, whoever needed it. Um, and I came up through that world of um, breaking news and, and sort of general assignment rewrite. Um, and uh, I paired that with feature writing, which I love to do. And, and they brought me to the the Washington bureau, um, the first weekend of, of Donald Trump's, you know, presidency, um, I covered the inauguration. I wrote features and it was supposed to be for three months and I'm still here and I've been on the white house team since 2018. So I have a very different background than a lot of reporters have at the paper. I think a lot of them who are a little older, um, well, a lot of them started their careers at the times as copy clerks or something. And then others, had that more traditional leapfrog path. And I took a completely different route through, um, through an understanding of, of digital media, I think. And Katie Rogers' first book is called American Woman, The Transformation of the Modern First Lady from Hillary Clinton to Jill Biden. Do you think Jill Biden's eight years as second lady assisted her in her new role? That's a good question. I mean, of course, in the sense that she understood um, <clears throat> the bubble, sort of the degree of protection that goes into <clears throat> um, the everyday life of, of those principles. Um, she had a lot more uh, freedom to move without attention or scrutiny, I think, than she does now. But, um, you know, I think that that was instructive. And um, I don't, you know, she worked with... Um, Michelle Obama on a military families initiative that um, she has carried forward, you know, through her time now as first lady. So there's that sort of connection. Um, I think it did. And and also I think, you know, the being able to teach as, as second lady, she was able to say, you know, you made this happen when I did this. So we're going to make this happen now. You know, she had that sort of understanding of what it took to get her there. Um, when they were already, when the Bidens were already in the administration. Was Michelle Obama a tough act to follow? I, you know, I I did not ask the current first lady this, um, but according to her aides and, um, you know, Biden aides going back to the vice presidency, yes, because Michelle Obama was the expectation surrounding Michelle Obama and what she would do with this platform and how she would use it and and even what she, how she would address things and what she would say and what she would wear. There was so much interest in her. And um, she really, Michelle Obama really leaned into a lot of that. And, um, you know, when one person said, you know, she made Washington cool, you know, celebrities wanted to be at the Obama White House they wanted to know what she was wearing and what designers and, and was she wearing J crew with, you know, a, des- a famous designer with mixing um, that. And then there was the whole, you know, first black first lady element of it. The ra- the racial scrutiny around her was enormous. And she navigated that, you know, by all accounts with grace and sort of a, a pragmatic understanding of what was expected from her. So, in that sense, following that, um, you know, there was, and and also though, we had another first lady in between the two of them that sort of, we can't leave out Melania Trump really, because that kind of even reset the expectations to zero when you had a first lady who um, did very little um, at times with her platform. So, um, you know, if Jill Biden had followed Michelle Obama, um, that probably would have been much more of a, a an interest or a you know a, a question, but um, you know there was that sort of that period uh, where things got a little um, unraveled and reset. Well, here's Michelle Obama from the 2008 Democratic National Convention. 
You work hard for what you want in life. That your word is your bond, that you do what you say you're going to do. That you treat people with dignity and respect, even if you don't know them and even if you don't agree with them. And Barack and I set out to build lives guided by these values and to pass them on to the next generation because we want our children and all children in this nation to know that the only limit to the height of your achievements is the reach of your dreams and your willingness to work hard for them. Katie Rogers, you describe Michelle Obama, iconic, straightforward speaking style, dry wit, little patience for politics, but did not want to live with the alternative version of that story if she didn't say yes to Barack Obama's run. Right. And that's that's in her own words. She's said that and written that, that she knew that this was she believed in his potential so much that she put her own um, interests aside professionally and personally um, to help him win, to campaign extensively for him, to sort of take the hits of being a first time campaign spouse, which she did when she misstepped or mis- misspoke. Um, she, you know, just it's as simple as that. And that is actually a traditional, you know, first lady habit or, or occurrence where, you know, these women, you know, don't want to take the added scrutiny and don't want to raise their children under the Klieg lights. And, you know, that is um, the choice she made um, out of belief in, in her husband. And you talk about misspeaking February 2008 in Wisconsin. Michelle Obama was criticized for this remark. What we've learned over this year is that hope is making a comeback. It is making a comeback. And let me tell you something. For the first time in my adult lifetime, I'm really proud of my country. And not just because Barack has done well, but because I think people are hungry for change. Uh, And I have been desperate to see our country moving in that direction and just not feeling so alone in my frustration and disappointment. Katie Rogers. Yeah, I mean, the context of that, too, is we weren't far down the road from, you know, the September 11th attacks. And there were there was so much anger over over how that had been handled by the Bush administration. But still, there was a huge swath of the American public who had um, given their their brothers, you know, their friends to this war. Um, So some of the criticism was rooted in that. And some of it was rooted in the fact that she, you know, this is according, you know, to people who were around them at the time that, you know, they believe that this was rooted in sort of racial animus, having a woman who um, a a black woman married to a, a black presidential candidate saying they weren't proud of their country. So there's the root of of the black experience in America as well that was sort of scrutinized and questioned. Um, I mean, there were there were all of these different, um, you know, these different sort of tentacles behind the criticism of of her and the one that sort of stuck to her, you know, throughout the rest of the campaign and the one that she was cognizant about was sort of being the angry spouse. Um, so that was that was a moment for her where she learned very early that something that felt emphatic, you know, hope is returning. My husband represents this. Um, It's a very fine line between that and um, criticizing or, or saying something that would be taken as criticism by a huge, you know, swath of the country. And here she is late in their administration from Tuskegee in 2015. And at the end of the day, By staying true to the me I've always known, I found that this journey has been incredibly freeing. Because no matter what happened, I had the peace of mind of knowing that all of the chatter, the name calling, the doubting, all of it was just noise. It did not define me. It didn't change who I was. And most importantly, it couldn't hold me back.
I have learned that as long as I hold fast to my beliefs and values and follow my own moral compass, then the only expectations I need to leave, live up to are my own. Katie Rogers. Isn't it interesting the different voices you hear from from a spouse, you know, of a candidate to a tried and tested first lady eight years on? I mean, that's that's my first instinct hearing those two things compared so close together. Um, the other is just, you know, think about all the things she weathered, you know, personally, you know, with, you know, this goes back to the Trumps as well with uh, Donald Trump and Melania Trump questioning um, President Obama's very citizenship. And that was something that went on for a long time. That is something that Michelle Obama has said she will never forgive the Trumps for doing. Um something that she had felt had endangered her family. They had two young girls in the White House. And um, that is the sort of scar tissue that develops in a role like this when politics is becoming increasingly calcified and tribal and sometimes dangerous. Um, And so you have a first lady at the end of her time saying all that matters is I know who I am. And that is, you know, looking at Michelle Obama now, the way she operates on the world stage is somebody who learned those lessons and is sort of applying them um, in her post-politics life. Did Michelle Obama or Melania Trump sit down with you? Neither did. Melania Trump engaged through a spokesperson, um, but Michelle Obama did not. Quote from your book, throughout their relationship, both made it clear to the public what each prized about the other. Donald Trump, a person motivated by power and money, shared that he felt that the third thing on his list, women, should take less effort than the other priorities on his agenda. Melania, whom her associates have said is largely motivated by the security and comfort of her lifestyle, has often spoken with a certain degree of pride of her ability to handle a man like Trump. The fact that she could stay with him, she has signaled, is a testament to her strength. Yes, I mean, they have been very, you know, they're, they were more forthcoming before he, you know, was a presidential candidate about sort of the the exchange the two of them were making in their relationship. Um, he gave several interviews saying, you know, if I, if I couldn't offer her money and security, what am I good for? And she has essentially back back then she would say the same thing, like this is an exchange. Um, So, you know, I think that over time, you know, talking to people who know them, um, you know, their their bond and and understanding of each other is is different than any of these other relationships that I write about in my book. But it's more of an exchange. I think, you know, I think she, you know by all, by many accounts that she cares about him um, and believes in him, you know, she wouldn't have supported him during um, the sort of the birther conspiracy if she didn't, to some degree, share a lot of those instincts. Um, she wouldn't have supported him through the Access Hollywood tape if she wasn't, you know, convinced in some degree that he was goaded into saying that, um, whether or not, you know, that's that's actually what happened is, you know, sort of irrelevant. If she was willing to go and defend him, she was angry over the stormy Daniels payments. But, you know, from my reporting, that's more about being embarrassed about the headlines, um, you know, as much as it was about being um, uh, about having infidelity in her marriage. They have an interesting uh, dynamic that is about um, in, in some ways the exchange of power. Hillary Rodham Clinton, Laura Bush, Michelle Obama, Melania Trump, Jill Biden, the first five first ladies of the 21st century. Is there a trajectory, Katie Rogers? In the sense that something, you know, of what might come after? Or just what are you seeing? Are you seeing a trend with these five? Is it different than it was 50 years ago, 20 years ago, or 30 years ago? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean... That's the crux of the book, I think, is that, you know, 
outside of the role, our society and our world is changing so much. Um, shifts in our politics, shift in, shifts in technology um, have have really provided um, avenues for these women to sort of um, step out of those boundaries and 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 be scrutinized for it. Yes, but also once the change is made, it's done. And, you know, that that's what I was saying a little earlier about um, Melania Trump, you know, really highlighted for Americans the fact that you don't have to do anything with this role if you don't want to. And there have been first ladies throughout history who did, you know, very little compared to Hillary Clinton or Eleanor Roosevelt, who's always the other sort of standard bearer. Um, but the fact that Melania Trump was doing this in our times as they are is is um, is almost radical. Um, so when you have somebody that comes in and sort of illuminates these sort of, you know, unwritten rules, um, regardless of how you feel about them, um, that is groundwork for the next person who has the role to say, well, you know, I, w- I still want to be first lady and fight for these things, but I'm also going to work twice a week, you know, and it becomes less of a radical idea when you have people who are pushing the boundaries um, uh, so in, in the public eye like this. Does that make sense? Let's close with a quote from your book. Americans have not seen another first lady quite like her since but Hillary's time in office permanently and fundamentally shifted how Americans view the role. Each woman who has come after her has faced perennial questions about what she may do with the platform she has been given, and of course, how far she might go. The book is called American Woman, The Transformation of the Modern First Lady, from Hillary Clinton to Jill Biden. The author, New York Times correspondent, Katie Rogers. All Q&A programs are available on our website or as a podcast on our C-SPAN Now app.